Wolston, WTP Bio. Walter Thomas Prito Wolston, 1840-1917, was born at Brixham, Devon, in the far south of England, on the channel, 40 kilometers from Plymouth. He was evidently surrounded and nurtured by godly influences. Around those parts at that time an F. A. Prito and an R. W. A. Wolston, probably related to Wolston, were active Christians in assembly life. He had childhood recollections of his father inviting preachers, such as Charles Stanley, to stay in their home. He said he had a pious mother. It is an inestimable boon for a man to have a praying mother and much, I know, mine prayed for me. But for twenty years I knew nothing of the grace of God, nothing whatever. According to his own testimony, he had been about the most thoroughgoing young worldling you could have met. When preaching he would say, there is not a man in this hall tonight, who is more deeply immersed in the world, in its pleasures, its sin and its enticements, nor a more downright, out and out slave of the devil, than the man who speaks to you tonight. Yet in one hour God saved me. Hence, I love to sing. Jesus sought me when a stranger. Wandering from the fold of God. He, to rescue me from danger. Interposed his precious blood. While he never went far into the details of his career in sin, he did mention that he had lived for trifles, without a thought about God. On leaving home, he entered a lawyer's office in his native town, intending to follow the legal profession. After office hours, there was not a ball or a concert, a regatta or a cricket match or a worldly entertainment of any kind, within twenty miles of where I was staying, that I was not in if I could get to it. On December 4, 1860, he left his country home in Devonshire for London to pursue his legal studies, planning to return home before Christmas to fulfill several engagements in his glee band. The first Sunday after reaching London his roommate suggested, What do you say we go and hear Richard Weaver? I see in the papers he is going to preach in Surrey Theatre tonight. The coal miner turned preacher was an instant legend whose rousing preaching attracted huge crowds and won thousands to Christ. Henry Pickering heard him and said, A greater God-made preacher has not been known in living memory. The moment he began to speak, at least in his palmy days, he sent a power and reality through the hearts of the thousands who thronged to hear him. You felt God was there. The Spirit was working. The bleeding lamb, of whom he loved to sing, was the center, and eternal issues were at stake. Wollstone could not have listened to a more dissimilar man. Wollston was an educated and cultured man. The preacher was an uneducated brute of a man who had been a feared boxer. His nickname was Dauntless Dick. Wollston's conscience took a beating that night. If he before had thought he was a sinner, now he also felt it. From Monday to Saturday, instead of spending the evening ranging the streets in search of the outer parameters of London's excesses, Walter and Tom went home early and prayed together and read from the Bible. The following Sunday evening they went to hear Charles Stanley preach the gospel from the story of Solomon building the temple. The meeting concluded and Walter turned to his roommate, What are you going to do? Tom answered, I am going home to have it out with God. Well, Walter said, You can go home, I shall stay and speak to Charles Stanley. In the vestry he met Charles Stanley, Mrs. Andrew Miller and her son Tom. Mrs. Miller had been watching for Walter. People were being converted all around, and polite Englishmen kept asking, Are you a Christian, and then, and would you like to become one? After a lengthy conversation, Tom Miller finally brought Walter to James 2 verse 19 and there the light dawned. Walter Wollstone entered by the door. Recognizing that a promise made is a debt unpaid, and that every Christian should honorably pay his debts, he wrote a letter to the conductor of the glee band, letting him know that since leaving home he had been converted to Christ. The Lord had put a new song into his mouth, and while he was willing to fulfill his legitimate engagements, he could now only sing about the Savior who had done so much for him. Needless to say, he was relieved of his obligations. Thereafter he took up the study of medicine. In 1864, sensing the Lord's call to Scotland, Wollstone left behind lucrative possibilities in London and went to Edinburgh. He was appointed house surgeon to the old infirmary after he had established a large private practice there. Dr. Wollstone was a combination of professional ability, spiritual depth, and personal warmth, universally acknowledged to be a skillful and kindly Christian doctor. He always found time amid his busy practice to tell the old, old story. 
He also rented halls and theatres for gospel preaching. Few professional men in Scotland were privileged to present the gospel to so many. He had a drawing influence with young men, and frequently lectured Edinburgh University students on spiritual subjects. In 1872 he began to edit God's Glad Tidings. The cover called it a monthly magazine purely gospel for free and general circulation. It was 20 to 30 pages long and had no graphics. Some of the anonymous contributors were really Wollstone's wife who would just leave one curious initial at the end of the article, such as the Gospel Appeal, Boast Not Thyself of Tomorrow by X. She was his match in evangelistic zeal. They both failed references to themselves in their articles, but we gather by reading closely that many of the conversion stories in the magazine are from their own way of life witnessing. Of course, as a medical doctor, especially in those days before sophisticated pain management, the medical doctor witnessed genuine soul trouble at the bedside of suffering and sometimes terminal patients. Wollstone enjoyed great freedom to deal with souls. Their magazine, later retitled The Gospel Messenger, continued for 45 years, the year of Wollstone's death, and many of Wollstone's gospel. Exhortations first appeared there. An interesting encounter with the evangelist Donald Ross occurred sometime between 1874 and 1879. Ross had personally trained under Duncan Matheson the Evangelist during the revival times of 1859-60, and in turn Ross had trained a corps of men in pioneer evangelism along the northwestern coast of Scotland. When Ross pulled out of the Free Church of Scotland he was vilified, the worst treatment coming from the unconverted Presbyterian ministers. Ross wondered where he should next go. We were being much exercised about what was to be done. We had heard of brethren, but only as bad, bad people, and we resolved to have nothing to do with them. Our information, however, came from the Parsons. This was a deeply trying time to Ross. He had a large family to support and many new converts looking for direction. Donald's son, C. W. Ross, writes. During this time of isolation he was approached by the exclusive brethren, who sought to win him to what they regarded as the Lord's way. He was invited to take tea in the house of one of them, and there met two of their leaders. The question was gone over quite fully, and, although, as he stated to the writer often since that time, the temptation was very great in the circumstances to cast in his lot with them, his difficulties were many, and nothing they could say removed them. It was the very same question with them as he was then contending with others about, the right on the part of any body of believers, great or small, to determine the lawfulness or otherwise of assemblies of the Lord's people. He had encountered the exclusive system soon after leaving the Free Church, and was not enamored of it then. And, although in this time of trial he was perhaps more disposed to listen to what they had to say than before or since, it is my never. Rejected their pretension to be able to draw a circle in Christendom. Inside of which only were meetings that could be recognized, and outside of which nothing was to be owned in the way of assemblies of the Lord's people. And we may add, when this pretension was adopted by others he was just as decided in rejecting it. We have heard that W.T.P. Wollstone was one of those men who met with Ross. Interestingly, between the years 1902 and 1908 Wollstone himself would find the shoe on the other foot when the influences of F. E. Raven would send packing many evangelically minded men. Wollstone cannot be termed a controversialist. Most of his writing is on evangelistic and devotional themes. He dearly loved to present the gospel. Regardless of the subject matter of his discourses to Christians, he would unswervingly finish by preaching God's salvation. Walter's brother Christopher injected himself into several controversies. Christopher was also a medical doctor. He is mentioned visiting John Darby shortly before Darby's death. The doctor asked the old man if he had any special thoughts as he viewed his death. Darby replied, There are three things which I have dwelt much upon to God is my father, and I am his gift to his son, Christ is my righteousness, and Christ is my object in life, and my joy for eternity. It is sometimes said that the so-called exclusive brethren are strong on Bible teaching but weak on evangelism, but this was not so in Wollstone's day and in many branches of that movement it is not true today. Although keeping the low profile and shunning ostentation, men like Andrew Miller, Charles Stanley, George Cutting, C. H. McIntosh and W. T. P. Wollstone were all men who shone in the gospel. Paul spoke of a fellow traveler with Titus, 
the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 18. Stanley, Cutting, and Wollstone would have all fit that description. It appears that Wollstone tried to stay clear of several church controversies that arose after John Darby's passing in 1882. In the fall of 1896, he stood by a grave in Cheltenham Cemetery and read Genesis 25 verses 8 to 10 and Hebrews 8 verse 10. The body being lowered into the ground belonged to Charles Henry Mackintosh. He must have wondered, as the true men of spiritual stature among them either died or were being pushed out. Finally, church problems between 1902 and 1908 caused WTPW to write a paper called Hear the Right. He was an impassioned man who eschewed hypocrisy. He gave up his medical practice in 1909 and thereupon answered invitations to visit Australia and New Zealand. He later visited Norway. During the second visit to Norway in February 1915, he had a stroke and was brought home paralyzed to Weston Supermare. He lay helpless for two years. His wife testified that the helpless man was happy in the Savior's love. Those who nursed him never heard him once murmur. A few weeks before the end he had another stroke and passed into a coma. On March 1917, at the age of 76, the good doctor made his appointment with the great physician, who forgives all our iniquities and heals all our diseases. Years previously, Wollstone had declared, I truly confess, beloved friends, that the day when I say goodbye to the earth, I shall say, from the bottom of my heart, thank God. If the Lord came tonight, we should break out, as we left the earth behind, into that noble paean, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 55-57, I would not be anything but a Christian for ten thousand worlds, and if you are not one, it is high time you became one. Books by Wollstone Another Comforter, 13 Lectures on the Operations of the Holy Spirit Backsliding and Restoration Behold the Bridegroom, 10 Lectures on the Second Coming and Kingdom of the Lord Jesus From Egypt to Canaan Handfuls of Purpose, Let Fall for Eager Gleaners Night Scenes of Scripture, 17 Bible Night Scenes 40 Days of Scripture Rest for the Weary, the Gospel from the Book of Ruth Seekers for Light, 14 Addresses to Edinburgh Students Simon Peter, His Life and Letters The Call of the Bride, and Other Gospel Papers The Church, What Is It, 10 Lectures on the Church of the New Testament Young Men of Scripture, 9 Addresses to Young Men We understand that W. T. P. Wollstone also compiled a hymn book which was reprinted at least 7 times. A total of more than 88,000 copies were published by 1933. These hymns are included in the hymns database on the truth for today's Berean CD-ROM. Materials taken from W. T. P. Wollstone, How I Found the Lord, The Conversion of W. T. P. Wollstone, Gospel Tract Publications, Glasgow. Napoleon Noel, The History of the Brethren, Chapter 2, London. Harry Ironside, A Historical Sketch of the Brethren Movement, Loiseau Brothers, Neptune, New Jersey. Apluk Ministries used by permission.